Hello and welcome to the UP Open University Faculty of Management and Development Studies Diploma in Land Use Planning final presentation for the local shelter plan of the municipality of Kawit Cavite. Presenting to you a group of diversified professionals, Team Kawit Cavite. Magandang Kawit, this is CLP Vince Alcantara from Puerto Princesa City. Good day, I am architect John Edward Kanda from the Municipality of Kawit, Province of Cavite. Hi, I am Jessica Julia Carino, a registered and licensed architect, a visual artist, a graphic designer, and a mom of two beautiful toddlers from Angela City, Pampanga. I am Donna Jun Seriola, geodetic engineer, and currently residing here in Makati City. Good day, everyone. I am architect Jesus T. Chua, a registered and licensed architect, real estate appraiser, real estate broker, and a master plumber. I do the design and build and general construction. I represented Tainta Rizal. Good day. I am Joan Fem Gutierrez, a civil engineer employed under the Municipal Planning and Development Office of the Municipality of Gloria, province of Oriental Mindoro. Hello. Good day. I'm Ray Antonella Jr., Maintenance Engineer at Gintong Bukid Farm and Leisure from Municipality of Nacarlan, Province of Laguna. Good day everyone. I am Janela Bidal. I graduated BS Accounting Technology and currently I am working at the Local Government Unit of San Antonio Quezon, which is also my hometown. On this presentation, we will discuss about the introduction, brief profile of Kawit, shelter needs assessment, affordability assessment, resource assessment, work and financial plan, monitoring and evaluation, annexes, and finally, the conclusion and recommendation. Now let's start off the introduction with architect John Edward Kanda. Thank you, architect Jessica, for the overview of our presentation. What is local shelter plan? As defined by the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, the local shelter plan, or LSP, is a roadmap to address the present and future housing requirements for both the formal and informal sectors of a city or municipality. It presents the local housing situation, household affordability, available resources, key sheltering measures, and an equivalent implementation plan. Furthermore, it responds to the needs of displaced households living in dangerous areas, affected by infrastructure projects, subjects of eviction, and victims of disasters of both natural and man-made. It also prepares the LGU sustainably in times of disaster, the impacts of climate change, and other natural and man-made calamities. It serves as a guiding document for the LGU to effectively and efficiently respond to the housing needs of the locality by avoiding and minimizing urban blight. The Local Government Code of 1991, particularly Section 17, provides the scope of services which charges the LGUs with provision of shelter and its related services, mentioned also from the Urban Development and Housing Act of 1992. Part of the scope is that LGU, with close coordination from the national agencies, will establish and develop resettlement sites for informal settlers, including the provision of adequate basic services and community facilities. And lastly, Housing development should uphold the people's rights, minimizing families living in areas vulnerable to disasters by strengthening the local institutional capacity for disaster risk reduction and management and building these resilient local communities from disasters including climate change impacts. Based on the vision crafted from the Executive Legislative Agenda, the developmental vision is Historical Kawit thrives as a center of business development and innovation home of resilient and empowered citizens under ethical, compassionate, and competent governance. Within the context of shelter planning, the same goal shall serve as the basis of this plan. To further suit the desired results based on the needs of the local situation and the community, we present the two goals and following objectives of this LSP. First is to deliver decent, cost-effective, climate-resilient services providing necessary facilities for an adaptable shelter to establish a comfortable, socially acceptable, and historically significant residential neighborhood. The objectives of this goal are as follows. To acquire a 2.87 hectares of land for housing and resettlement beginning 2023 until 2031. To reduce the double-up households 
by building no less than 10,199 units between 2023 to 2031. To relocate the 1,023 displaced households starting from 2023 to 2031. Facilitate the provision of security of tenure to 133 households needing land tenure upgrading from 2023 to 2031. However, this data needs to be revisited and updated. To upgrade the power facility of 150 households starting 2023 to 2031. To upgrade or provide access to potable water to 1,164 households starting 2023 to 2031. To upgrade or provide sanitation facilities to 4,489 households starting from 2023 to 2031. To provide existing roads or provide access roads to blank households starting from 2023 to 2031. To provide the existing drainage system or provide drainage to a total of 21 households beginning 2023 to 2031. To actively promote the structural renovation of blank deteriorated households beginning in 2023 to 2031 to make them more hazard resistant resulting from climate change. Please note that there are no available data as of today. The next goal is to formally implement the Kawit Local Shelter Plan in a manner that is compatible with the municipality's other related development plans, programs, projects, and activities. This can be achieved by strengthening the housing bodies to guarantee customer and LGU satisfaction during the LSP 2023-2031. to To establish local institution rules and other frameworks required to implement the shelter plan and meet the locality's housing requirements. To set up adequate evaluation and monitoring for the plan implementation. To facilitate access to employment and income generating activities. The target population is those households identified as belonging to the first to third income groups or the informal settlers' families and households. The target population is those households identified as belonging to the first to third income groups or the informal settlers' families and households. The table shows the identified 1,016 households or ISF living in waterways. 80.91% of them owns the house and 1.08% are sharing. 7.48% rent the property and 10.53% have no recorded data. These families and households are the priority of the local government to be the beneficiaries of the housing development program. The planning and formulation process requires key players with their given responsibilities as listed by DSU. And these are the local chief executive, Sangguni Ambayan, department heads, an LSP Technical Working Group, DSUD, Key Shelter Agencies, Provincial Housing Development and Management Office, and the Data Collection Team. Together with representatives from the Office of the Municipal Mayor, Office of the Municipal Planning and Development Coordinator, Barangay Captains, Councilors and Secretaries, University of the Philippines Open University Students, and the Faculty of Management and Development Studies, carried out the primary data collection and survey. The formulation of a shelter plan involves six main activities. Stage 1 is the data gathering. It involves data collection, survey, and ground validation of available information. In this stage, data requirements and maps are collected. Next is situational analysis. It is a process of looking into the current housing situation. Examples are housing needs, housing-related problems of the locality, and the initial assessment of the LGU's capability to implement housing projects. In this space, an assessment of affordability and resources is done. The information and outputs of this particular phase will be the basis for formulating the main strategies. Then goal and objectives formulation. At this stage, alignment of the housing development perspective with the ELA was made. Vision from ELA was lifted as a general development guide, including the goals. Next is generating shelter strategies. A comprehensive assessment of housing needs, affordability, and local resource provides a good basis for the local planners and decision makers 
on how to respond to local housing situations. The decision was translated into shelter strategies, demand affordability, resource matching analysis, back up the corrupting of shelter strategies. Stage 5 is developing the implementation plan. This operationalizes the strategies identified based on situational analysis. And lastly is monitoring and evaluation. This stage facilitates the identification of milestones and the determination of the time frame and manner by which action should be monitored and the desired results or outcomes to be measured. The planning period covers the duration that will be needed to realize the housing vision of Kawit, which is a minimum of 9 years to be divided into 3 phases. 2023 to 2025 is the first 3 year planning period, followed by 2026 to 2028 and 2029 to 2031. In this case, the program period of 3 3 years is the time frame set to meet the target housing needs due to backlog, population growth, and upgrading needs. Moving on with a brief background of the municipality of Kawit. The earliest settlement in Kawit during the Spanish colonization is called Cavite el Viejo. The introduction of Catholicism in Cavite can be recognized from the construction of St. Mary Magdalene Parish Church, which is the oldest church in the province. Kawit formerly includes the town and cities of Imus, Cavite City, Nobeleta, and portion of General Trias. Its present name was derived from its hook-shaped shoreline geographical formation, which is the Filipino term for a hook, is Kalawit or Kawit. Kawit is the cradle of Philippine independence through the leadership of General Emilio Aguinaldo, the first president of the Philippine Republic. With a series of victorious battles against the Spaniards, General Aguinaldo proclaimed the independence of the Philippines from the Spanish colony on June 12, 1898, from the balcony of his mansion. Kawit is geographically located in the west of Luzon and south of Metro Manila. It has 23 barangays divided into two areas. Ten barangays are situated in the coastal areas and 13 are inland. Based on the CLUP 2012-2022, it has a total land area of 2,220.18 hectares. Kawit is classified as having Type 1 climate based on the Pag-asa Cavite Station, Sangli Point, which means it has distinct wet and dry seasons, and 8 to 12 are the average typhoons that pass through the region. However, severe habagat rains have recently flooded all of Kawit's 23 barangays. Five barangays in the municipality experience floods directly during each storm season. However, six barangays are moderately vulnerable to flooding and total 17 barangays are extremely vulnerable. All barangays in Kawit are sensitive to earthquakes or ground shaking. 17 barangays are extremely sensitive to liquefaction while six barangays are only slightly vulnerable. Storm surges of less than 1 meter constitute a threat in the 10 barangays. And tsunamis threaten more than half of Kawit, all of which are located close to the Bacoor Bay. Kawit's low-lying area in the province has a limited source of resources. These are mainly mangrove forests and deep wells or groundwater resources. The 10 land uses that the municipality has categorized its entire land area are residential, commercial, industrial, infrastructures, institutionals, parks and playgrounds, recreational spaces, cemetery, waste management, tourism, and agriculture. The table shows that the majority of the land area was for agricultural use, but this has to be checked with the ongoing updating of Kawit CLUP, as some areas were reclassified and not yet updated. The Philippine Statistics Authority conducted the most recent census of population in 2020. The population of the municipality of Kawit increased by 28.84% from 2015 to 107,535. Kawit's population has increased by 24,069 during the past five years, a figure that is 18,812 greater 
than the 5,257 growth between 2010 to 2015. Therefore, it demonstrates Kawit's rapid urbanization. The development of the planned unit development area creates jobs that encourage immigrants to Kawit. According to the table, the growth rate rises to 2.57 in 2020, five years after it started, a 1.68% rise in overgrowth in 2015 and a 0.58% increase growth in 2007. The development of planned unit development area creates jobs that encourage immigrants to Kawit. According to table, the growth rate rises to 2.57% in 2020, five years after it started, a 1.68% rise in overgrowth in 2015, and a 0.58% increase in growth in 2007. Kawit's population is equally distributed among 19 barangays. Four barangays are densely populated. Barangay Toklong has the largest share of the total population with 21.99% and Barangay Poblacion has the lowest population with 0.76%. Based on the 2020 Census of Population and Households of PSA, Kawit has a total population of 107,535 with 27,096 households. A very young population resides in Kawit. Ages 0 to 21 comprise 55.86% of the total population. The population contribution of each group gets smaller as it gets older. Next of the population comes from the age group 5 to 9 years old at 9.48%. The productive population or the working age group approximately range from ages 15 to 64 represents 667 of the population. The total gender population of Kawit is almost equally divided. The female population is only 0.012% more than the total population of males. The total gender population of Kawit is almost equally divided. The female population is only 0.012% more than the total population of males. The municipality of Kawit has a total of 11 public and seven private elementary schools as of school year 2021 to 2022. Public and private elementary schools have a total enrollment of 8,249 and 541. Kawit has two public and seven private secondary schools. The total enrollees for public and private junior high school are 5,984 and 610, while 1,462 for public and 354 for private senior high school. For health and sanitation, the municipality saw a double-digit increase in COVID-19 cases in August 2021 and the most documented cases since the start of the pandemic. The entire local government unit collaborated to develop a workable plan for starting a community-wide vaccination program because vaccination against COVID-19 is one of the primary actions in avoiding and reversing the unintended effects of the pandemic. The graph emphasizes the rising number of persons who had vaccinations over time. The local health office has two doctors, one of which is a consultant with two health units and four health facilities. The local housing of Kawit has recorded 22.10% of dwelling units that are composed of wood based from the 2021 assessment. 72.29% of housing units are composed of concrete, brick, stone, and half wood, iron, asbestos, while 1.29% are made of nipa and 4.01% are temporary structures. For social services, the municipality of Kawit offers 24 daycare centers run by 11 daycare workers who act as a replacement parents for young children aged 0 to 4. In total, 1,400 kids benefited from the 24 daycare facilities where they received training and preparation for their primary education with an emphasis on the development of social and moral values and gender awareness. While for protective services, the ratio of police officers is 1 for every 1,605 people with 15 mobile patrols.
for fire protection, 23 staff composed of 22 non-commissioned officers and one fire assistant. They also have three working fire trucks. Two are representatives of the national government and one is of the municipal government. The majority of Kawit's land use for growing crops or food has been converted to other land uses. The remaining regions that are exploited for agricultural production, however, stay idle while Kawit expands. The operation of peace funds and fisheries remains a significant economic activity in Kawit despite the development of good agricultural farmlands. On the roads and highways fronting access to Metro Manila, fishermen sell the mussels and oysters that they are harvest. Livestock and poultry production can only be categorized as small-scale backyard grazing. Common livestock includes chicken, cows, carabaos, ducks, and pigs. The total number of business establishments recorded in 2022 is 3,272, which constitutes a substantial increase of 1,649 establishments from 2012. However, the global pandemic caused by COVID-19 affected the economic growth of Kawit. The tourism industry, on the other hand, is one of the top and most significant sectors of the economy and requires support. It creates jobs and promotes the expansion of the small and medium-sized businesses that are the foundation of our economy. The promotion of historical and cultural consciousness through tourism is successful, and because Kawit has a rich historical background and cultural legacy, the municipal government has focused its efforts on developing the tourism industry by repairing and protecting some of the city's key tourist spots. In the process, tourism will boost the local economy, educate the populace about the importance of history, and most significantly, instill a sense of civic pride in them. Public transportation in Kawit is mainly by passing through buses, jeeps, and tricycles. Kawit's proximity to Metro Manila relies only on buses and jeepneys through land transportation. While there are no airports, seaports, cargo ports, or significant land transportation hubs, there are other support transportation facilities, including waiting rooms and public parking slots. The built-up area, which is concentrated in the northern portion as well as the eastern and western boundaries, which are also becoming built-up areas, are provided with electricity with an aggregate length of power lines mostly installed along municipal and other major roads. A total of 18.39 linear kilometers of pipelines, most of which were installed in the built-up areas in the northern section of the municipality. The franchise owners of the telephone system in Kawit are the private companies PLDT, Smart, Digital, Islacom, and Globe. This section will help determine the accumulated housing need at the beginning of the planning period, facilitate understanding of future shelter requirements due to population growth, and identify settlements requiring upgrading of tenure, housing structure, and basic community infrastructure and services. Nearly 10% of Cal's total land area is occupied by housing units. The 2013 survey reveals that 84.28% of dwelling units are single detached type and conveniently house a radio, television set, and refrigerator. Based on the 2000 survey of dwelling units by construction materials, 22.10% of dwelling units are made of wood. Dwelling units made up of concrete comprises 45.84%, while 1.28% are made up of NIPA, and 4% are makeshift or temporary. For the analysis of the existing housing situation, the year 2020 was the blast census year and the year 2022 was assigned as the base year. Based on the 2020 census of the Philippine Statistics Authority, 
the municipality of Galit has 107,535 population with 103,491 total number of households and 19,510 housing stock. The average household size is at 3.6 and the average annual population growth rate is at 3.23 percent. Based on the 2020 data, it can be deduced that there are 1.49 households per dwelling unit. Furthermore, there are a total of 1,023 displaced households and zero homeless households or individuals in the municipality. As mentioned in the previous section, the base year for the LSP of the municipality of Kawit is the year 2022. With this, the planning period is 2023 to 2031. This is further divided into three planning periods. The first planning period is from 2023 to 2025. The second planning period is from 2026 to 2028. And the third planning period is from 2029 to 2031. Presented in the table are the housing population number, number of households, average household size, and housing stock. With an annual growth rate of 3.23%, the population is projected to be at 152,551, and the number of households is projected to be at 41,256 in 2031. There are three categories of households considered for backlog. Double gap households, homeless households, and space households. Doubled up households refer to the number of dwelling units shared by two or more households. Based on the 2020 data, it can be deduced that there are 10,199 doubled up households. On the other hand, there are zero identified homeless and 1,023 displaced households in the municipality. As you can see in the table, these are the housing units needed annually due to backlog and population growth. Around 1,135 1, units annually are needed to provide shelter for the double that household. This is a total of 10,199 households for the span of the planning period 2023 to 2031. A total of 10,266 units are needed for additional households due to population growth for the planning period 2023 to 2031. This is divided to around 1,034 units annually in the first planning period, around 1,137 units annually for the second planning period, and around 1,251 units annually for the third planning period. In summary, combining backlog and future needs, 6,836 dwelling units are needed for the first planning period, 7,142 dwelling units for the second planning period, and 7,397 dwelling units for the third planning period. This accounts for 21,376 dwelling units for the municipality of Kawi. The term upgrading need is defined as the need for improving the following. First, land tenure status and other tenure schemes. Second, access to basic services. And third, the housing condition. First, the LGU defined those people with secure tenure as those individuals of the evidence of documentation that can be used as proof of secure tenure status. Unfortunately, there are still 133 households that do not have security of tenure on, our, on their dwelling units. Secondly, infrastructure improvement is needed if the dwelling unit lacks access to one or more basic services and utilities. Assessment shows that there are 150 households are without electricity, 1,164, are without adequate water supply, 4,489 are units without adequate sanitation, 21 units without drainage system. Lastly, structural improvement is needed for dwelling units made of temporary and or substandard material located in identified hazard areas and has insufficient living areas which do not comply with national standards. Notable barangays with dwelling units in need for structural upgrading are Barangay Wakas 1, Barangay Wakas 2, Barangay Poblacion, Barangay Polvorista, Barangay Santa Isabel, and Barangay Panamitan. For the summary of the upgrading needs, for the tenure need, it is 0.68% of total housing stock. Units without electricity is 0.77%. 
units without adequate water supply is 5.97% of the housing stock, units without adequate sanitation is 23% of the housing stock, units without drainage system is 0.11% of the housing stock, and units needing structural improvement is 0.16% of the housing stock. To continue, affordability assessment. In determining the affordability of housing of the target beneficiaries, the planner categorized them into six income groups. The following assumptions are drawn in assigning the income groupings based on the data gathered by the Municipal Planning and Development Office. The first income group, composed of farm workers, farmers, tricycle drivers, small fisher folks, odd job men, scavenger, barbers, job order workers, sidewalk vendors, laborers. With monthly income, 7,539 of the total need of 14.70%. The second income group, composed of tricycle operators, casual workers, small businessmen, and foremen, with a range of 7,540 to 15,000 monthly income with a 45.30% of the total need. The third income group, composed of permanent employed, skilled laborers, call center agents, small-scale business owners, with a range of 15,001 peso to 30,000 household monthly income, with 24% of the total need. The fourth income group, composed of OFW-supported families, medium business owners, agents, supervisors, managers, with a range of 30,001 peso to 45,000 pesos, household monthly income, with 6% of the total need. The fifth income group, composed of middle class professionals, department heads, counselors, etc., with a range of 45,001 peso to 60,000 pesos monthly income, of the total need of 6%. The sixth income group, composed of highly paid professional, entrepreneurs, and large-scale business owners, with a range of 60,001 peso and above, monthly income, with a total need of 7%. As derived from the Family Income and Expenditure Survey, the percentage of the potential income for upgrading new housing of target beneficiaries are 14.70%, 45.43%, 24%, 6%, 3%, and 7% for 1st income group to 6th income group respectively. There are 5 considerations for affordability of households for housing. 1. Assess value of the land. 2. Pricing 3. Location 4. Afford by the beneficiary and last, shell out by the LGU. The table shows the affordability analysis and land calculation. Potential annual cost for housing 14,760 first income group 27,724 second income group 55,350, third income group. 92,250, fourth income group. 129,150, fifth income group. And 132,600, sixth income group. And the total land deed for all income groups, 151.34 hectares. Upon consideration of the affordability assessment of target beneficiaries, the following are the housing options identified per income group. For first income group, public rental three-story tenement style, low-rise housing, approximately 64 residential units per building. For second income group, raw house. For third income group, develop land which includes concrete roads, covered drainage, septic vaults, electrical connection. For fourth income group, develop land which includes concrete roads, covered drainage, septic vaults, electrical connection with subsidized 20 square meter shell row house. For fourth income group, 
develop land which includes concrete roads, covered drainage, septic vaults, electrical connection with 32 square meter loftable row house. Income group, develop land which includes concrete roads, covered drainage, septic vaults, electrical connections with 32 square meter loftable duplex. And for the sixth income group, single detach with a total number of units of 21,376. And for the next table, shows the affordable housing options cost in detail. There are three options, lot acquisition, site development, house construction. Chapter 5, Resource Assessment Assessment of available, required and potential supply and stocks for shelter provision is termed as resource analysis. Resources must be first identified and assessed for the LGU to be able to respond to the housing demands. In this chapter, land resources, infrastructure resources, and finances and possible sources of funds are analyzed. This chapter is necessary because in resource assessment leans the possible and ideal courses of action to take to pacify existing and future problems within the planning area. Moving on to land resources, land is classified as one of the most critical requirements for shelter development. Limited or lack of government-owned land to accommodate housing project is a common scenario among LGUs. This is the reality of most of local government units when it comes to local shelter planning. Here are two important factors to consider when it comes to choosing lands for shelter development. First, land shall be accessible to many forms of employment and business opportunities. And second, it shall have available transport system for the workforce. These factors may be attributed to several reasons such as policy restrictions on land banking, affordability, land availability when concepts of a safe environment is integrated, and others. As for the municipality of Kawit, the listed potential land for housing is currently unutilized or vacant. It is not categorized as primary agricultural area, which meant that if ever reclassification is required, policy restrictions won't be applied. This makes easy possible utilization of the land for the purpose of shelter development. Using Hazard Hunter, listed is the result of an overly analysis conducted in the area. It showed safe for ground rupture and earthquake-induced landslide but is prone to ground shaking and tsunami and is highly susceptible to liquefaction. It is also 49.4 km north away from Taal Volcano outside the permanent danger zone, safe when it comes to ballistic projectiles, bay surge, and volcanic tsunami, but given its distance from Taal Volcano, it could be reached by ash falls. It also was identified to be very high susceptible to flood, prone to storm surge of less than 1 meter, but is safe from severe winds. The land that undergone the analysis is located in Kaingin Kawit, owned by Opal Portfolio Investments Incorporated, which has a total area of 28,672 square meters. Based on the 10-year planning period, Kawit will be needing more or less 138.10 hectares of new housing units to accommodate double occupants and future population based on shelter needs assessment conducted. Comparing the total needed land with the land available, there is a difference of 135.24 hectares, which only entails the huge insufficiency of Kawit's available land. The municipality is targeting to maximize this available area through building high-rise housing to create more units to accommodate the housing units needed, which was projected to total a number of 21,376 as tabled in Chapter 3. Infrastructure Resources RA7279 or the Udhalo, under Section 21, mandated the local government units and the NHA 
together with private developers and concerned agencies to provide basic services and infrastructure facilities for socialized housing and resettlement areas. These facilities are potable water, power or electricity, and adequate power distribution, sewerage facilities, adequate solid waste disposal system, access to primary roads, and transportation facilities like drainages. In case service provisors fall short in satisfying the requirement of the current and future needs, each service provider must be well informed of the demand for the next 10 years as tabled below. For financial resources, in matching the financial resources, the LGU must ensure that there are funds available to spend with a deliverable set from the shelter needs assessment. This will determine how the project and their activities will become operational and functional. From the type of affordable options presented and recommended by income group levels and housing units needed, the total estimated cost was derived. The operationalization of the housing development of Kawit will require a total of 9,875,564,160 pesos. The estimated cost will cover provision of new housing across all income groups associated with the needs assessed. Obviously, a substantial amount to implement this plan is a major consideration. The municipality of Kawit, the first-class municipality, cannot afford to implement this plan from local funding sources. Essentially needed to carry out this plan is the outsourcing of funds. Identification of potential sources of funds from national agencies, civic groups, and private institutions is critical in this plan. It is necessary to tap private land developer companies to seek assistance in aiding Kawit's future housing and shelter needs. Potential funders can provide a variety and range of options to be accessed by the LGU. Apparently, no data were available to fill up this table. For the Chapter 6, I will be discussing in detail our work and financial plan for the local shelter plan of Kawit Cavite. This is the implementation plan provides the details on how the strategies adopted will be carried out including the required action, responsible persons, target dates of the accomplishment, implementation tools, and materials and resources required to undertake the activities. Kawit Kabite created the following table that contains work and financial plan to implement the local and shelter plan within 10 years, which is 2022 to 2023. The work plan is the project has to be introduced to all eligible settlers within the first eight months. The construction duration shall be up to nine years. And by the 10th year, all housing units shall be turned over to all the beneficiaries. As you can see, the work and financial plan is among the core elements, if not one of the most essential parts of planning in general. There are two goals for this plan. And the goal one is to formalize the establishment of the Kawit Housing Board and institutionalize the Kawit Local Shelter Plan in a way that is consistent with the municipality's other associated development plans, program, project, and activities. There are three objectives under this goal. The objective number one is to strengthen the housing bodies to guarantee customers and LGU satisfaction during the local shelter plan of 2023 to 2031 implementation and to establish the local institution, rules, and other frameworks required to implement the shelter plan and meet the locality's housing requirements. The strategy for this objective is the creation of Kawit Housing Board. And the program or the project or the activity 
is the creation of Kawit Housing Board composition and function and providing funds thereof, establishment of local shelter plan office and staffing, strengthening the local shelter plan, undergo seminars and training, etc. Conducting feasibility study for the proposed housing development project. Sourcing out funds for the housing project partnership with the government line agency on housing development and the responsible agency is the local housing board the estimated cost for this objective is about 700,000 for the meeting expenses office supply logistic supply maintenance and other operating expenses the source of the fund is coming to the LGU and to the national expenditure program and this is expected to accomplish by the year 2023. The next objective is to set up the adequate evaluation and monitoring of the implementation of the Kawit Shelter Plan. The strategy for this objective is the establishment of the Oversight Committee within the Board. The program or project or activity of this objective include the creation of Housing Board legislation the establishment of an oversight committee that will serve as the evaluation and monitoring agency of the Kawit Shelter Plan. The responsible agencies are the local housing board, including the ex officio officials. Estimated costs for the meeting expenses, office supply, logistics supplies, and maintenance and other operating expenses is worth 500,000 pesos. The fund source will be coming from the LGU and the National Expenditure Program. This is estimated to accomplish by the year 2023. And for the third objective of the goal one, this is to facilitate access to employment and income generating activities of the household beneficiaries. The strategy is the 21st cent era development funds and general funds for the livelihood projects. The program or the project or the activity is to coordinate with the MSWD to determine the indigent and the vulnerable households. And for the inter-agencies coordination on the livelihood projects for the said most vulnerable households. The responsible agency is the MSWD. And the estimated budget for the allocated funds for the livelihood project will be 2 million pesos and the fund source will be coming from the National Expenditure Program and expected to accomplish by the year of 2023 to 2024. The next goal for this plan is to carry out the implementation of the local shelter plan proper that is decent, cost-effective, and climate-resilient responsive for the necessary facilities for an adaptable shelter to establish a comfortable, social, acceptable, and historical significant residential neighborhood. This goal has 10 objectives. Number one is to acquire or access or develop the 2.87 hectares of the land for housing and resettlement beginning for 2023 to 2031. The strategy of the objective is to process of the acquisition and a legal documentation. The program or the project or the activity of this objective is to conduct ocular inspection for the proposed housing project for the location in coordination with the local shelter board project management office. Request for the site investigation with the DANR, including the consultation with the authorities. Other one is to conduct the LAD service and LAD subdivision under the authority of the municipal assessor. And the negotiation with the LAD owner with the assistance of the municipal legal officers, including the procurement processing and application for the titling of transfer. The responsible agencies for this objective is the MVDO, municipal engineering office, municipal legal officers, and the municipal assessors. Estimated cost for the mobilization expenses, legal fees, traveling expenses, and other related expenses is 14,350,000, which be funded by the LGU and expected to be accomplished by the year of 2024 to 2025. 
The second objective is to reduce the double up household by building no less than 10,199 units annually between 2023 to 2031. The strategy of this objective is ensuring the compliance of Republic Act 7279 or the 20% balance housing. And the program or the project or activity is ensuring the number of houses to be built annually is within the required threshold of Republic Act 7279 prescribes. And the responsible agencies are the Municipal Local Housing Office. The estimated cost for the operational expenses will be 1 million pesos that will be funded by the LGU and expected to be accomplished by the year 2025 to 2026. The third objective is to relocate the 1,023 displaced households starting to 2023 to 2031. And the strategy of this objective is relocating those living in the hazard zone and informal settlers. The program and the project of this activity is through the help of the enforcement agencies to relocate the residents living in the hazard zone and the informal settlers. The responsible agency will be the Municipal Local Housing Office. And the estimated cost for the mobilization expenses, traveling expenses, and other related expenses will be 8 million pesos which will be funded by the LGU and expected to be accomplished by the year of 2026. The fourth objective of this goal is to facilitate the provision of security and tenure to 133 household needing. And the strategy of this objective is the provision of necessary legal documents for the security of tenure of various households. And the program or the project or the activity of this objective is to lead by the municipal legal officer and municipal assessor the processing of legal documents to ensure the legal right of the household including their security of tenure. The responsible agencies for these objectives are the municipal local housing office, the municipal assessors, and the municipal legal officers. The estimated cost for the legal expenses and other related expenses will be 10 million pesos that will be funded by the LGU and expected to accomplish by the year 2026 to 2027. The PIP objective is to upgrade the power facilities of 150 households starting 2023 to 2031. The strategy is the power access development and the program or the project or the activity is the survey and investigation of the power lines. Second, detailed planning and estimates. Third is the procurement and the implementation of the power supply materials. And the responsible agency will be the engineering electric cooperative or the electric provider. The estimated cost for the power access will be 20 million pesos that will be funded by the local power provider and estimated to be accomplished by the year 2027. The sixth objective is to upgrade or provide the access to potable water of 1,164 households starting 2023 to 2031. And the strategy of this objective is to access of water. And the program and project or activity of this objective is drilling and piping and installation of the stub out and the procurement and the implementation for the water supply. And the responsible agency for this is the Kawit Water Work System. The estimated cost for the water access development will be 10 million pesos that will be provided by the local water provider and expected to accomplish by the year 2027 to 2028. The seventh objective is to upgrade or provide the sanitation facilities to 4,489 households starting 2023 to 2031. And the strategy of this objective is the sanitation facility. And the program or the project or the activity is to conduct a detailed planning and preparation for the sanitation facilities in the area and lead aside implementation activities. The responsible agency will be the engineering and the municipal health office. The estimated cost of this implementation will be 3 million pesos that will be funded by the Department of Health 
and expected to be accomplished by the year 2028. And the eighth objective is to upgrade the existing roads or provide access road to the household starting 2023 to 2031. The strategy of this objective is the development access road. And the program or the project or the activity is to survey an investigation of the prospect public works for the area and detailed planning and estimates including procurement and implementation. The responsible agency will be the engineering office, contractor, and the DPWH. The estimated cost for the road development will be 100 million pesos that will provide by the local government unit and the national expenditure program. And this is expected to accomplish by the year 2028 to 2029. The ninth objective of this goal is to upgrade the existing drainage system or provide drainage to the total of 21 households beginning of 2023 to 2031. The strategy of this objective is development drainage system. And the program or the project or the activity of this objective is to survey an investigation of the prospect drainage system for the area and detailed planning and estimate including the procurement and the implementation. The responsible agency will be the engineering office, contractor, and the DPWH. An estimated cost of the road development will be 10 million pesos that will provide by the local government unit and the national expenditure program. This project is expected to be accomplished by the year of 2029. And the last objective for this goal is to actively promote the structural renovation of the deteriorated households beginning of 2023 to 2031 to make them more hazard resistance resulting for climate change. The strategy of this objective is the hazard resistance housing and the program or the project or the activity is to conduct a detailed planning and preparation of the hazard resistance home and to lead site implementation activities. Responsible agencies are the MENRO, Municipal Local Housing Office, and the MDRRMC. The estimated cost for this objective is 500 million pesos and estimate to accomplish by the year 2029 to 2031. Overall, we can agree that work and financial plan streamlines the plan's objectives, employed strategies, responsible agencies, and incurred costs. But not only that, it was also able to show the proper division of work in case of the interagency's correspondence, like the local shelter plan. Strategies employed by each agency are, of course, more within the bounds of the agency itself. Architects Ichua from Tainta Rizal. I am hum humbled to present to you my contribution and participation in the progress of Kawit Kabite, which is considered as the cradle of our independence. My part deals with the monitoring and evaluation of activities relevant to local shelter plan. Monitoring and evaluation functions independently, yet the results of these actions can yield an impact on the current activities. It results actions are necessary to make the plan or project to be revisited or revised. MNE direct the activities, shape the plan, and deliver the appropriate action. The facilitation of the activity becomes beneficial only when it to address the needs of the st stakeholders are met. A well-formulated MNE scheme can serve well the community from the government officials the investors, and the citizens who are the prime beneficiary of the local shelter plan. Through the result of the MNE, the community can become involved in sustainable development projects, which will later one yield rewards to a larger scale. 
the municipal planning and development office is responsible for overall coordination in drafting to include the content, sourcing, and packaging of the plan. The LSP formulation processes begins with an orientation by the HDUCC to provide the local government an overview in the local shelter plan. It can involve also the DPWH, Municipal Planning and Social Welfare Office. The monitoring scheme looks into what is implemented, why is it is implemented, and how it is implemented. When the what, why, and how it is implemented appropriately, accountability can also be identified. Collaboration between and among the stakeholders can easily be created. The evaluation part identifies the area which are successful and for improvement in evaluating a particular project the trajectory of the results must be toward a better implementation of the project or program. In the MNE scheme, success indicators are also included so that stakeholders can celebrate whatever little victories the plan has achieved because the assessment tool is clear among the stakeholders. As indicated, Planning of the project takes three periods. The type of the project, the budget allocation, and the manpower available are the same considerations that determine the length of time given to a project. The success of an, any endeavor comes with a carefully laid out plan. The plan should be able to present and address issues and concerns for its first year period. The succeeding years are meant to be taken with seriousness since there are periods where the proportion of the goals are set are meant to be achieved. This has been architect Susti Shua. Our first map was the Flood Susceptibility Map of Municipality of Gawit. So this map has a flood hazard map showing evacuation centers. And as we can see, the blue is the water bodies and the small line represents the rivers and creek lines. As we can see, Barangay Polborista is near Bacoor Bay and Barangay Binangkayan Kaonlaran Marulas, Kaingin, Poblacion, Santa Isabel, Panamitan, Wakas 1, Wakas 2, Tabun 2 are major barangays that are prone to flood. For the earthquake-induced landslide susceptibility map of Municipality of Gawit, red represents the high susceptibility, violet represents moderate susceptibility, yellow, low susceptibility, white not susceptibility and and the stripe line for possible landslide disposition or affected zone for ground shaking hazard map here are the number year ready for gma project ground shaking hazard map of gawit where red represents the pbox earthquake intensity scale with intensity level number eight and above pink has intensity level Seven violet has intensity scale number six and yellow has intensity lower than six. And as we can see in the map, Kawit is under the PVOX earthquake intensity scale intensity number eight and above. For tsunami and fissuring hazard map, here is the Namriya tsunami hazard map of Kawit where the wave height was measured in meters. Navy blue represents less than one meter. Blue represents one to two meters. 
Green represents 2 to 3 meter. Yellow represents 3 to 4 meters. Orange represents 4 to 5 meters. Red represents 5 to 6 meters. And maroon represents 6 to 7 meters. As we can see in the map, municipality of Gawit was very prone to tsunami wave height with 6 to 7 meters. Especially the Barangay Santa Isabel, Wakas 2, Barangay Kaengen, Barangay Marulas, and Tabon 3. For population or household exposure to liquefaction, here is the Namria Liquefaction Hazard Map of Kawit, where the liquefaction potential, red is to high, violet is to moderate, and yellow is to low, where Kawit is under high and moderate liquefaction potential. For population or household with most population of ISF along waterways, here is our plotted map where it is generated from the Excel file from the LGU from least to greatest number of ISF for barangay. For potential areas for housing development, this was assessed by the flood susceptibility map. So the barangays that are safe and has a potential for housing development was Barangay Tabon 1, Tabon 3, Barangay Gahak, and Toklong. We conducted an interview to several ISF of six barangays of Gawit, and we have the sample questionnaires which we ask their primary information, information of their members of the family, and we've also asked if they are willing to relocate if there is available housing resettlements and how much could they pay for a month. Here are the survey results from the respondents from the shortlisted barangays with ISF. We've interviewed 1.2% ISF from Barangay Santa Isabel, 9.5% from Panamitan, 10.8% from Barangay Poblacion, 10.4% from Barangay Pulborista, 5.4% from Barangay Wakas 1, and 62.7% from Barangay Wakas 2. 21.7% of the respondent has a concrete house. 55.7% of the ISF respondents has a mixed materials and 22.6% has the wood material of houses. The result of the survey said that 81% admitted they do not own the property, 3% of the respondents declared they own the property, and 17% did not declare if owned. We have also asked the respondents if they are willing to relocate if there is a housing unit available and the survey results has 76% are willing to relocate if offered a housing unit, 8% are not willing to relocate, and 16% are undecided. Survey results also said that 56% of the respondents are willing to pay 100 pesos to 3,000 pesos for the monthly amortization, and 44% did not declare the amount they can afford to pay for the monthly amortization. Thank you, Engineer Donna Jean Sariola, for presenting us the maps and the survey results. And now let's proceed to the other part of the annex, which is the worksheets. So we have the number of households needing to tenure, upgrading by barangay, number of households needing adequate sanitation upgrading, and this table still needs to be updated due to insufficient data. For the next slide, it's the households needing adequate drainage system upgrading and households needing adequate garbage collection upgrading. Same thing, they both need to be updated. And lastly, the households needing structural improvement upgrading. So this is regarding the barangays, the shortlisted barangays that we have interviewed. All right, so also in addition to our annexes, we have the photos that we have documented. And let's start with the weekly team internal meeting that we had last March 5, 
and that's the beginning of it all, and followed by another team internal meeting via Messenger and Zoom, and we had our mock presentation, our mock entrance conference with Professor Carmi, followed by another team internal meeting last March 22 via Messenger, and then we had another a weekly team internal meeting last April 16 via Zoom and also Messenger. And we also had our team face-to-face workshop last March 15. That was the day before our entrance conference where we have finalized our presentation. And then on March 16th, we had our first conference or entrance conference proposal presentation at Tangulan Hall in Kawit, Cavite. And we had a photo opportunity with the LGU officials. And then on April 3rd, we had our courtesy call at the office of the mayor and city administrator. On the same day, we had the distribution of survey questionnaires, key informant interviews, and focus group discussions on barangays with informal settler families. So we had our KII and FGD for Barangay Panangitan, and uh, we had a conversation with Barangay Chairperson Mr. Gilbert O. Reyes. So he's with us on the photo. The following will be a photo opportunity with Barangay Chairman of Wakas Dos, Mr. Roel Morados, and... Good thing he helped us on the survey questionnaire distribution. Up next is another photo opportunity with Barangay Captain Rene, where we had a survey questionnaire distribution, KII and FGD for Barangay Wakas, uh, especially at the cemetery where there are residents and informal settlers living there. And lastly, for the photo documentation at the Barangay Pulverista, and we were assisted by Barangay Chairperson Mr. Noriel Gonzaga. And we went through the residents, the informal settlers near the coastline. And finally, for the conclusion and group recommendation. So for the overall conclusion, based on the survey and face-to-face interviews we have conducted with several constituents of the shortlisted barangays, the following are the realizations and conclusion according to the needs of the informal settlers. First, majority of the residents are willing to be relocated to a more decent housing. However, the stated land is not enough to cover all the informal settler families. Second, there are also those who would rather stay where they are, even though they were once relocated to a new housing community. And the informal settlers either sell the unit they received or look for somebody to rent. The common sentiment of those who are living near the coastline is that it is in fishing where they find their source of income, which sustains them on their day-to-day living. So these informal settlers are willing to stay despite the typhoons and floods. Also, the residents want to be relocated somewhere they can still keep their source of income or where there are employment opportunities and accessible means of transportation. And therefore, our group has come up with some options or recommendations for the local government unit of Kawit to best address the problems and other concerns of their residents. And first is to prevent this scenario to happen again, there should be a proper tagging for the entitled households. Those who have previously received the housing unit will no longer be eligible to acquire from the local government unit of Kawit Cavite. Second, the LGU can partner with private sectors in funding and acquiring additional land area to accommodate the informal settler families. Public-private partnerships are ideal for social and economic development in projects such as this. And this is the end of the presentation. This has been Architect Jessica Julia Carino. This has been ENP Vince Alcantara. This has been Architect Jean Edward Kanda. This has been Engineer Donna Ginsayola. 
This has been architect Jesus T. Chua. This has been John P.M. Gutierrez. This has been Ray and Pinella Jr. This has been Janelle Bidai. And, and we, we are, are the team captain.